Our reading from the Hebrew Scriptures begins at Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 to 6, and then turning to chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. On the third new moon, after the Israelites had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They had journeyed from Rephidim, entered the wilderness of Sinai, and camped there in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. This is the word of the Lord. In the beginning was the word. In 1956, Paramount Pictures released the dazzling religious epic, The Ten Commandments, starring Yul Brynner as the Pharaoh and Charlton Heston as both Moses and the voice of God. As part of the publicity for the film, director Cecil B. DeMille placed monuments containing the Ten Commandments throughout the United States. To accomplish this, DeMille joined forces with a Minnesota juvenile court judge named E.J. Rugemer, who had been erecting displays of the commandments since the 1940s. He did this based on his conviction that the troubled youth of America needed a moral center, a moral foundation. Between them, DeMille and Rugemer are believed to have been responsible for between 100 and 2,000 monuments made of granite, shaped like the traditional tablets of the law, and inscribed with the words we are about to ponder and study for the next four weeks. And despite efforts to remove many of these displays based on an argument of the separation between church and state, in 2005, the Supreme Court ruled that the monuments could stay and that they were historical, not merely religious. The case, Van Orden v. Perry, was decided by a vote of five to four. And here we are, studying these words together. Scholars have a hard time pinpointing exactly how ancient these words are. And according to my reading, there is good scholarly foundation for the idea that they were anywhere between 3,000 and 16,000 years old. That is quite a span. That is quite a lot of uncertainty. And yet their significance continues to be hotly debated. Are they general rules for living, applicable to all? Are they commands to be upheld only by those who were part of God's covenant people, newly escaped from slavery in Egypt? Or do they include those brought into the covenant by Jesus Christ? And why is it so hard to memorize them? More on that next week. There is actually a very good explanation for why they are particularly hard to memorize. Let's start at the beginning which is to say in the days and months leading up to God's and Moses' conversation on Mount Sinai. The Hebrews approach Sinai freshly released from captivity, newly freed from their 400 years of enslavement. God has led them out across the Sea of Reeds. Uh, we used to incorrectly translate that as the Red Sea, simultaneously freeing them and destroying their enemies. The months in the wilderness have brought challenges. As you can imagine, issues of food and water came up right away. In each case, God provided for the people. Now, three months later, 
they have entered the wilderness of Sinai, the area surrounding the mountain. Again, modern day scholars are not exactly sure where the biblical Mount Sinai is. There is a modern day Mount Sinai uh, in Egypt, Sinai Peninsula. That's as good a location as any. That's the one that people tend to favor, but there are at least three other good possibilities as well. It is notoriously hard to say where astonishing and holy things happen. Suffice to say that people camped out here and Moses went up the mountain to meet with God. In the beginning was the word. God begins with a reminder. Tell the people, God says, remind them who I am. You know what I did. I rescued you. I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. And implicit in all that is I changed the laws of nature for you. A sea parted. When you were hungry, I sent bread from heaven. When you were thirsty, I provided water from a rock. I was there for you. I was there for you. I swear the Lord God sounds like an anxious suitor trying to propose. And in a sense, that is exactly what is happening. God is saying, you are already mine. You are already my people. I've taken responsibility for you. Let's take this relationship to the next level. This is a covenant relationship, which, by the way, is one of the ways that we understand marriage. First comes love, then comes marriage. Or in this case, first comes love, divine love, as enacted in God's works of rescue and sustenance. Then come God's claims on our behavior. Then comes the spelling out of the terms of the covenant. Unlike what we would consider a ideal modern day marriage, one party in this case is entirely empowered to spell out all the terms of the covenant because this is the relationship God is defining between deity and humans. God gets to do that. If you obey my voice and keep my covenant, God says, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you should speak to the Israelites. In the beginning was the word. Now, have you noticed a funny lack of something in this passage that we've been reading? Have you noticed the complete absence of the word command or commandment? Instead, God tells Moses, these are the words you shall speak. And that's a faithful translation of what we find in the Hebrew. The Hebrew word for word is debar, or in plural, debarim. These are the debarim I want you to speak. This is why you'll sometimes hear people refer to the Ten Commandments as the Decalogue, which now we're in Greek, but that means the ten words. Here's something fascinating. The word, word, is also translated from the Hebrew throughout the Psalms as promise. God's commands to us, God's word to us, are also God's promises to us. God gives us God's word. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. God's claims on us are based on God's already having rescued us. It all goes back to who God is, how we understand God. But you know, we who are Christians in Endicott, New York in 2014 could reasonably ask, how does this apply to me? I wasn't a slave in ancient Egypt. And depending upon how your life has gone so far, the idea of God having rescued you may or may not resonate 
it may or may not feel accurate to you. Are we included in this covenant? One answer to this question has to do with how we view the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, or what Jews call the Bible. Do we take the Hebrew scriptures seriously as God's word to us? For the past two years, I've been using a preaching tool from September through Pentecost called the Narrative Lectionary. And the answer to this question, according to the makers of that lectionary, is emphatically yes. The Bible that Jesus knew is our Bible too. The story of Jesus makes no sense whatsoever, absent the context of the scriptures in which he grew up immersed. The Bible is the story his ancestors clung to. It's the story of God and God's people in time. And though it's pretty common to think of the God of the Old Testament as being about law and the God of the New Testament as being about love, there is only one God, a God of both law and love. And we change the way we tell the stories over time. But it is still one God. As we hear in familiar frames like, the Lord is kind and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, the God of the First Testament is indeed a God of love and mercy. And as we see in this prelude to the Ten Commandments, first comes love. Another answer to that question, does this apply to us? can be found in your bulletin, question number 90 from the Presbyterian Catechism. Why did God give the law? And the answer is, the law was the great charter of liberty for Israel, a people chosen to live in covenant with God and to serve as a light to the nations. It remains the charter of liberty for all who would love, know, and serve the Lord today. The Ten Commandments are God's word, not only to the ancient Hebrews, but to all who would love, know, and serve God through our faith in Jesus Christ today. And the nature of these words is that they contain both command and promise. God makes a claim on our behavior, both towards God and towards one another. And God promises that our living into and living up to God's claim will be a sign to the world that we are, in fact, God's chosen, precious, beloved children. Those who are chosen and precious and beloved are always exposed to standards of behavior, from teaching a toddler not to hit when they're mad, to teaching a teenager to speak to others, including their parents, with respect. To love another, even another who's not a child, a parent, a partner, a friend. To love another is to enter into an agreement with them about our behavior. In marriage, we take vows to love, honor, cherish, be faithful in all circumstances. First comes love, then come our claims on each other. We expect the best of one another, and we promise to give our best to one another because we love. In the beginning was the word. It was a word of covenant, which means it was a word of love and a word of command and a word of promise. It was given in love to further love. And whatever your view on DeMille's or Rugemer's displays, or Charlton Heston's acting or activism, it is a word. And these are words that are still living and moving and having their being in us today. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>